Yes. And this Sunday afternoon at 4.30, an exciting new series, Terror Hawks, comes to your screens. <laughs> Terror Hawks, every Sunday at 4.30 on London Weekend Television. I had joined forces with a, a man who was a wonderful businessman and accountant. His name was Christopher Burr. And he said, why do you keep on wanting to make television series for other people. Why don't we make our own television series and take all the money that comes in, you know? Well, that sounded very good to me. So naively I said, yeah, okay, fine. So I wrote a pilot script for Terrorhawks. And then I ran into the problem that, that Christopher Burr was indeed a very, very good businessman. I mean, he was absolutely brilliant and an incredible accountant. But now, of course, I, having thought it was a good idea, I had to live with all the restrictions that were imposed on, on me. And I had said, well, I'll need such and such a stage at Pinewood. And he would say, let's see what the cost is. And I went, that's going to cost a fortune. Why do you need it? explained that we needed a stage for the puppets and the bridge over the top and headroom and so forth and so on. He said, well, he said we, can't, we can't raise that sort of money. Is there no other way you can do it? So we went to Bray Studios. It's a small studio on the Thames and had a look around there and it was fairly dilapidated but it was affordable. And Suddenly I came up with a brainwave because we went on to one of the stages, very small by comparison to Pinewood, but they had a big hatch in the floor and when we lifted it, it was in fact a water tank. There was no water in it, but it was a provision for a water tank. And it was big enough for probably five people who knew each other intimately, <laughs> to squeeze together and operate puppets from below. And so having come up with that, that idea, we had to make glove puppets. And I'd never made a glove puppet, nor had I made anything with glove puppets. The puppets were made, instead of having a body in the same way as the marionettes, they were moulded in rubber and painted, faces painted on, and uh, the arms and hands. So we started to carry out tests to see if this was feasible, and it looked as if it would work. So it seemed a good idea that if we could make it for that price, it would have been really great. And so we prepared for the production. And how detailed is the brief that is given to you by Jerry Anderson? Well, it was a little bit vague at the time because I don't think that they got a, a script going, but they knew that the sort of characters that they were wanting, um, such as an older hero, um, which turned out to be Einstein, a beautiful English girl, uh, which turned out to be Mary Falconder and a beautiful coloured girl which um, was Kate Kestrel and so on you know so forth through the other characters we had to um, get out some plasticine heads take them over for them to be seen and uh, well he did there wasn't a sort of a tremendous brief in fact so I was young star uh, Hudson and later came Stu Dapples and then a lot of incidental characters that uh, Jeremy and I would pick up between us uh, apart from his principles there were loads of others that we we hammered out between us so 
Uh, Tiger Neinstein, who is obviously the head of the Terrorhawks, uh, interestingly enough, was uh, a character when when Jerry showed me the puppet um, of Tiger Neinstein at the time he had no hair and he looked a bit like Humphrey Bogart. So Jerry said to me, you know, why don't you have a go at Bogart? So it was, you know, hey, Terrorhawks, stay on this channel. This is no major. And he said, nah, it's not working, not working. Uh, he asked me who my favourite impression was at the time, and I was doing a lot of Jack Nicholson uh, uh, stuff. And so I just went, Terrorhawk, stand this... Ch and he went, great, love the voice, but it's just too laid-back. Jack is too laid-back, so let's just give him a little bit more oomph and punch. And then it was, Terrorhawk, stay on this channel. This is an emergency. But So it's, it, you can hear the sort of that Jack thing going on, but it's a little bit more, you know, dramatic. Uh, the creation of the voices was um, a sort of collaborative, organic kind of thing. Um, Jerry was very good at just letting us sort of bring to the table whatever we felt would fit. And, and always encouraged us to just try stuff, you know. I mean, he, he stepped right back and he would just let us mess around and see what came out. Uh, it's fairly straightforward a lot of the time. So voices like Hudson, he simply said, um, you know, we need a nice voice to fit this fabulous car that, that talks, that talks back. Rather like they do now, it's a bit spooky. Um, but, so that was fairly straightforward. Jeremy can't talk posh, so I got that job. And then after that, uh, 101, and we decided, you know, I did that kind of, because I think Kenny Everett was around then and he had those sort of camp characters, you know, oh my lord, you know, all that sort of stuff. So uh, we uh, did a bit of that and he went, yeah, I think we can, I think we can work with that. <laughs> so he let that go, slip that one through. And so 101 was, was born. And years later, had an affair with Hero in space. Very weird. I must say, you look truly magnificent. So tall, so beautiful. Oh, why, thank you, Lieutenant. Not you, 101. I was talking to my Narcissus. It's just come into bloom. Oh. I think. And of course, Hero, um, Lieutenant Hero, this uh, sort of half American, half Japanese uh, intellectual uh, super being up there in the uh, space hawk. Uh, it was uh, just a question of being a little bit Japanese. Of course, in the 1982 version, we could play on the 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 L's and the R's, you know, exactory and glean fry and all of that. Exactory. When they ask me how I do Zelda's voice, I just think, well, now, I always liked doing old women. I used to love doing Grandma Baggins. And I, uh, it's very easy for me to be wicked. I think I must be rather wicked, actually, because I just love being evil. So it came very naturally to me. <laughs> Zelda, obviously, is a character. I think anybody, any kids who watch the Terror Hawks, um, were genuinely quite frightened by uh, Zelda. She looks hideous. She sounds hideous. Uh, Kill him, of course. Kill him. I think Youngstar is uh, just... Uh, Robbie does such a great job on Youngstar, and he really is the clown of the show. I, again, I mean, one of those characters that, that uh, we were just trying voices. Jeremy tried something, I tried something. Jeremy tried something, I tried something, uh, we all tried something. And eventually, Jerry, had, he was in the, in the uh, control room and he kind of, he turned his back to go out and get a coffee or something. And, and I did a sort of a Dalek voice, which I had done since the original days of the Daleks. And uh, it, I simply said something like, you know, um, sort of thing. And he turned around, he stopped him in his tracks, actually. He turned around and came back and said, who said that? I said, well, I, did. I, I thought he was going to tell me off. <laughs> I said, no, that was me, Jerry. <laughs> and he said, can you do it again? I said, so I did it again. And I, he said, can you sustain it? So he read some of the script with, with me. Like that. And it, it softened a bit. I think, young star, big carry board, little brother, grab it, crunches, and all this sort of thing. <clears throat> came and went and, and, and the character stayed and that was, that was the voice. But I mean, seeing the puppet, and I'm not sure we had seen them at that stage. I don't know if they, it was that way around or we, um, they, probably we had some idea, some sketch or something. 
no, I say to myself, it was perfect for the puppet because he, he was always drooling and eating and being a slob. So a nice dribbly voice seemed to work. So yeah, that's how Youngstar was born. Oh, oh, I'm down. I'm upside down. I must have landed in Australia. On this production, we had our miniature sets, but instead of the puppets being dri dropped in from above, they were now pushed up through a hole in the set from underneath. And the mouths were operated by a finger and thumb, so they made them talk. Um, and they could, of course, walk. They were, they were more like a Jim Henson puppet than the ones I had been using. Whatever style of puppetry you've got, you've got different sets of constraints. And um, it's quite interesting because if you operate from behind, then you've got the problem of getting rid of the puppeteer. So you have to have blue screen or, or green screen to get rid of them. Whereas you're, if you're from underneath, actually, most of the puppeteer is hidden. So that's, that's, that's a plus point. But although I arrived after a lot of those decisions had been made, we looked at the rushes and Jerry was getting really flustered and was getting really concerned. He was going, oh, I remember coming in and finally, he was, he was sort of going, well, I'll try the puppet this way and that way. And finally he just cracked and he went, oh, Hera looks like a blithering idiot. So we had an emergency remake of, of Einstein and he had to be remade. And actually it was, probably was a good thing because he wasn't that great to start with. So there were little changes going on. And then also, as the writing continued, more and more characters came into it. And so there was a lady called Susan Moore, I think, and she made a lot of the monsters, and they were fantastically made. They were brilliant, like Shram. And I think Sistar came in later. She was the, um, the sister of Zelda, and, and she was, had this mad cackling laugh, and she had different coloured wigs, and, and the wig had to sort of slip off. It was <laughs> quite bizarre. And Wonderful! <laughs> In the meantime, my partner, Christopher Burr, decided that he wanted to be a record producer. And so he went off and recorded some, in my view, really great songs. And he said, you ought to put one of these in to each episode because, you know, people get to like it, we'll do big record deals and so forth. So there was a puppet called Kate Kestrel. You even have one of your characters already on the verge of signing a recording contract to a recording company that just happens to be and Burr Records. Yes, yes, it's a strange coincidence, but uh, Kate Kestrel, um, portrayed in, in the flesh by uh, a very talented young lady called Moya Griffiths, who's a, a new find, completely uh, inexperienced, has a marvellous voice, and um, strangely enough, looks very much like Kate Kestrel and uh, we'll have the unique uh, opportunity to present um, Kate on screen in the series and also the real live Kate Kestrel singing and dancing and, and uh, doing, acrobat doing acrobatics um, singing the, the songs of Kate. How does an attractive lady like you become involved with dangerous things like terror hawks? Well, to start at the beginning, my father was the commander-in-chief of a NASA moon base, so it was natural that I should go into uh, space travel, really. And I started through medicine via NASA and then went into uh, space travel as an experimental craft operator. And it started from there. Those little sequences were, you know, very, very good, I thought. The trouble is that in the middle of an action drama, it was quite difficult to to break into song. You know, it reminded me of some of the old Hollywood mov movies where uh, they would be talking one moment and then there was a cue and they would speak the first two words and then straight into the song and the orchestra would join in. So it was very much like that. Hawkeye, you on the wing? I sure am, ma'am. You have a 1050. 10-10. The very first uh, craft that I designed was the, the Hawkwing. 
And uh, I have to be honest, I used an old design from one of my amateur uh, projects to kick kickstart it. And uh, it, it went through several modifications. Uh, originally, I wanted the drooping wings on it, so it looked a bit like a zero X uh, in certain positions. And uh, then, but Jerry insisted on going upwards, which I wasn't so wild about. It made, made the craft look very flimsy to me. Um, so that was the, my first, the first craft that I involved, uh, designed. Uh, I think that was closely followed by the Battlehawk, the big heavy duty transporter. Um, the main brief was that it shouldn't look anything like Thunderbird 2, which I don't think it did. It looked, um, it's my least favorite of the vehicles. It looks like a flying brick to me. Uh, and, uh, and also that had to have on its back the Terrorhawk command center on its back, which also was a separate craft, which uh, once the Battlehawk arrived in the, the area of conflict with Zelda, this thing would separate from it to a better vantage point where Einstein and company could control the, the battle with uh, Zelda's nasties. Uh, and, then, and then after that, I think the other vehicle was the, the Treehawk, which came out of uh, this uh, tree canopy, which opened up, blossomed open uh, like that. Um, that was very heavily inspired, the tree part, by uh, the wilting trees, palm trees that you got on the Thunderbird 2 um, launch sequence, which I always thought gave it massive scale. Uh, so we tried to, I tried to incorporate that feel in that, uh, that particular launch sequence. It was probably the most, most boring looking of the craft, I think, but uh, a lot of people seem to quite like it. Space Hawk was, uh, again, uh, it was Phil Ray involvement there. Um, he, we were, basically Jerry needed a, a spacecraft, an interesting spacecraft, really quick. And uh, Phil customised an existing craft that he'd made uh, out of a lot of kit-bashed techniques and stuff and customised it into the Terrahawks colours uh, for us. And it, it helped, it was, among other things, it helped to sell the show. Uh, it looked quite different from a lot of the other craft, but I didn't think that was a bad thing. It's meant to be massive. Um, so it would, uh, it would uh, actually house a lot of other uh, vehicles, which we never really saw much of as the show, um, you know, went along. Uh, and the main craft were patterned and then sent out to be moulded by a professional mould-making company who were used to doing radio-controlled aircraft. So those, those fibreglass panels patterns came back from the company and they had to then be finished, sprayed and detailed. And uh, so I, somebody was assigned to do that as I was working on other things. But it became evident that the models didn't quite look filmic. They didn't look realistic. The main craft were looking very architecturally accurate and beautifully sprayed. And they didn't have that, those little nuances that we were used to seeing on Derek Medding's work all those years ago. So... You know, we were all a little bit worried about that, particularly myself, Steve, Steve Begg, Mark Harris. We couldn't quite work out what was going on, but nobody seemed to be drawing any, anyone's attention to this. Uh, at this stage, Ian Schoons was special effects supervisor, and I don't think people felt they could approach Ian about this. I think decisions had obviously been made somewhere along the line. However, I think word got back to Jerry at some point that the models weren't looking real. They were looking like toys. Uh, so Steve Woodcock and I were called up to Jerry's office uh, one day and we were asked what we could do to improve the look of the models, which in our opinion was to basically strip them down to their bare paintwork, respray them with dirtying down more accurate panel lines and various bits of graphics, letter set to make them look much more filmic. We couldn't do a lot with the structure of the model. We couldn't recess panels or anything like that because uh, it was all too late, really. Uh, so that's what we did. Steve Woodcock and I basically detailed all the main craft in both scales uh, to get them ready for camera. The sad thing was that all this was done after the Bandai company had photographed all the models ready for toy production. Things would come up that you'd, you'd, I'm not sure you volunteered, you just seemed to end up doing things, like voiceovers, you'd go over to the, the recording studio, oh, I just need this or this, that, and other. And 
uh, which uh, there was this script that I read, and it said Spirilla, and I'm thinking, oh right. Um, and then Richard Dr- Greg- Gregory came in, and he said, "You'd do for the Spirilla," and I've gone, "What? Yeah, yeah, yeah." So I think it was. I'm not sure whether it was Richard or someone came down and said, "Would you do it?" And I said, "Yeah, give it a go." It's another experience, isn't it? It's to be given an opportunity to be in front of a camera, to do stunt work. <laughs> and as a martial artist, I know how to throw myself and this, that, and other. So, um, yeah, Richard was the one that had the costume made. But I really didn't know what <laughs> the implications were of wearing a suit. And it was filmed in June or July, I can't remember. It was hot, even with the studio doors open and a fan going. It was so hot in that suit. Um, There was a a lad assigned to me to... Because the head was fastened at the back because it was was a big, big head. Um, But it was fastened at the back. But there was one moment... Where I, because you're breathing inside the helmet and it's there isn't a lot of oxygen. And because I couldn't get the head off, nobody's paying any attention to me. Everyone's wandered off. I got into a panic. I needed to get this head off. It's only the one time, but it, it wasn't good. It wasn't good. Plus... I had to be shot. So the effects of that, and again, we had to discuss, were we allowed to use red colour? Because it's a children's programme. And after a couple of days, we were advised, no, you can't. So we had to use green. So we had Swarfiga in items pinned to my body. And then (laughs) at certain points... I had to, they were detonated and um, I would then fall into the, into the ravine and then to, but uh, I remember when the first one went off, I didn't realise that you'd actually feel it. I thought it just like a, a little cracker. It, it winded me. That's what I looked at Terry afterwards. I said, is it supposed to do that? And yes, of course it does. All right, okay. So I also operated the little tiny docking arm which comes out over the battle hawk in the in the battle hawk silo. I remember doing that, trying to do that as steady as I possibly could. I think in the end we shot it in reverse. I think that was a general rule of thumb with things that have to hit an end point is to shoot them in reverse. So I operated that and one or two other bits and pieces throughout the shoot. When we when I read the script that we had to make the spaceship for the close encounters thing. I was intrigued on how they're going, to, how we were going to make this flying saucer fly, and I thought, "Ooh, this will be interesting." show called Cry UFO, I think it was, it was called, and there was a requirement within the, the, the filming for a, a UFO to be seen uh, coming over horizon and also being shot through uh, from a low angle looking up past a house. And this is another Steve Begg bit of brilliance, I don't know where he got it from, but he, he had the model shop uh, led by Simon Deering create a very small perspective-sized uh, landscape, which could be th- fitted in front of the camera. So it was locked off to the camera, so wherever the camera looked, it wouldn't move. Uh, and we could use this as a holdout mat for shooting what was effectively the UFO in the distance, and it would create a silhouette in the foreground so that when we tracked in and passed the UFO, it would make a, a counter mat, which, when the film was back wind and the UFO was removed, we could light for the foreground this tiny little set and when the film was viewed in the, th- in the rushes afterwards, what you effectively saw was a UFO coming from the distance, moving over the horizon, lighting the horizon with its reactive lighting, 
uh, and moving over camera. <coughs> it looked, to all intents and purposes, like a close encounter shot. <laughs> The uh, my favourite one of my favourite elements of the of Terrorox, which we shared uh, to a great degree with the puppet uh, stage, were the uh, Zeroid characters. I thought they were highly successful. Uh, I'll take a little bit of credit in that I designed them, but the basic concept was Jerry's. And these were a metal ball which used to stand on a special stand. And they, we had a sergeant major, and I was sure that they would become huge merchandising items. They didn't. Um, so a lot of the action with the zeroids, obviously when they were, they were, they were talking or what have you, they were radio controlled and cable controlled uh, uh, models that were in scale with the puppets. But uh, for a lot of our stuff, we had a little kind of, uh, from what I remember, three foot spheres which we, we catapult across the stage. Uh, and again, using various camera techniques, uh, like shooting in reverse, um, we, we'd bring them to life. Uh, I thought they worked very, very well. I even used stop motion on them uh, for a couple of shots where they, they all have to come to attention in this big uh, hall that uh, Sergeant Major Zero is addressing them in. We had a model called the Zeroid Barracks, which was designed or sketched out by Gus Ramsden when he was on the production and it came down to myself and Steve Woodcock to make this. Uh, it was quite a big set. I think it was sort of eight feet by four feet and had uh, all sorts of kind of channels on which zeroids could roll depending on which side the gimbal was, was tipping. So we, we built this. We built lots of tiny zeroids, which were basically spheres uh, glued together with a sort of inset with eyes. Uh, and we must have made hundreds of these zeroids throughout the time on the show, and they were always getting lost. They were rolling under people's benches. And, of course, when we got them on set onto the tilting gimbal and one of the technicians pulled down the gate, they'd, they'd rock and all fall out onto the floor and roll around. And, you know, that's generally what happened. I, I had quite an affinity with, with the zeroids because for the first 12 episodes when I was working on the puppet stage I you know what we you know what we used to do is is for the zeroids jumping off the their little pedestals we would flick them out and they bounce off and then we, the editor would reverse it so it comes in and a lot of time that was my job to flick the zeroid off um, and if, so if you've got three frames I think my 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 fingers have been in more shots than anybody else's um, but yeah, uh, I thought they were ni very nice characters. Um, I, the cubes, I wasn't quite sure. I, they, they didn't seem to me to have the personality. You know, when especially you've got someone like, you know, Windsor Davis doing the voice, you know, and, and, and Dick Sweet and stuff like that. You know, they had a very nice personality. And um, yeah, I enjoyed work, working with them. I hated the cubes. I thought they were dull and boring. Um, they were based on a pencil sharp that Jerry had on his, uh, his desk. They were really difficult to do anything interesting out of. Um, so uh, they, they were, the, the, the cubes, the zeros were my favourite elements, the cubes were the least favourite. <laughs> the, the, the work that I, I, I liked the least in Terror Hawks uh, was the flying stuff. Uh, I found that the most trying, uh, mainly because a lot of the craft were obviously uh, supported on wires and I tried every trick in the book to try and stop them looking like they were supported on wires. Uh, we obviously had to paint the wires out, you know, if they were against a blue sky we put blue on the, on the wires and it helped and Harry Oakes, our, our cameraman, was very experienced with a lot of the older Century 21 shows so he knew a lot of tricks to try and take the sheen and the, the, the shine off the wires. I um, also tried to shoot things backwards sometimes so that they wouldn't, they'd have a kind of weird motion in them, uh, which wasn't too, any, I took basically anything I could think of to try and hide the, the, the fact they were on wires. I, I mean, it's my least favourite work. Other vehicles, other flying vehicles, uh, they generally fell off wires. The Hawkwing was particularly bad because it was so wide for its length. It had that incredibly wide sort of wing. 
So it was very ungainly, very difficult to balance it on any kind of structure. So that came back a few times. I don't think there was anything I dreaded because it was just great fun. The tiresome thing was, you know, you might have a couple of days doing model sets which you'd have to sort of build all the sets and things like that. And then you'd have to take them all out to get the space shots, which would just be sort of a black room. So there was a, there was a lot of clearing up and moving about. But I, I think, if anything, it, it would be the explosions. You know, that's what I really look forward to. And, and as, as it went on, you know, once, once I, I took over and started doing the special effects, uh, the explosions, you know, it would always be, can we do it a little bit bigger than the, the other one? Can we do, you know, make it a little bit more spectacular than that? Well, I think everything generally went right all the time, but the, the, there was always, to coin uh, uh, a Terry Hawk's phrase, you had to expect the unexpected, because things just didn't pan out the way you'd like. Uh, as I say, we used to use high-speed cameras to get uh, explosions on certain uh, kind of models. Sometimes the explosions were so fast that even at high speed, you'd just, it'd just be, the thing would disappear, you wouldn't see anything. <clears throat> and all it would be left was a cloud of uh, smoke. And only afterwards when you came in, as I say, we were standing there on the stage sometimes, you'd realise that some of these models were made out of uh, <clears throat> a wax so that they'd explode uh, better with the detonation, the heat of detonation. And when you're prizing these pieces of wax out of the backing, if you realise that could have been potentially somebody's head, uh, you would know that you were probably better off standing outside next time. One of my favourite sequences, which I love, because there's, there's one in one of the last episodes where I think we blew up this oil refinery and it was like Steve said, just just put everything into it, you know, and it was, it was, it was just, you know, we had this sort of uh, firing board and I think we had about 17 explosion on a tabletop and if you ever see it, it, it was brilliant. <laughs> Always a sense of uh, theatre around the uh, explosions when we had them going. <coughs> Partly because I think it's a healthy male attitude to see something blown to a thousand smithereens. Uh, also, it's because we knew we were working on Jerry Anderson production, we were going to get our explosions. I think, you know, Terror Hawks was unique because it had this crazy uh, tongue-in-cheek approach to what was an adventure show. Uh, and uh, Tony Barwick, who was the script editor and lead writer, uh, is mostly responsible for the tone as kind of like a, uh, the lead writer on the whole thing. Uh, Tony Barwick, he, he was so clever in what he did, you know, spoofs on famous things, like he said a gold finger, it was cold finger, and, and all of this going on, and, and, and the characters like Stu Dapples, who was really a bit hopeless. It's, for me, it was all about the characters. I mean, OK, you've got your superheroes and everything else, but that's what made it fun, all these different characters coming in and out, and great big monsters like Shram, and the difference of scales that we were using. I, I think it was exciting, and the people I spoke to enjoyed it. I mean, it was it was different even then. It was it, and it was new, and because it hit people who, like me, had been brought up on uh, Thunderbirds and, and uh, Stingray and all those, Captain Scarlet appreciated it. It was very much in the same vein. Uh, and Jerry nurtured this idea of <coughs> keeping the, the the show light and frothy and. Uh, there was as much comedy in it as there was uh, thrills. Uh, and that kind of lent it a unique kind of feel, which was like other Anderson shows, but somewhat different. And I think that's what engages me about it, is that sometimes I couldn't believe it wasn't a full-blown comedy. And other times it was like, had such high adventure in it that you, you know, it was a great fusion of it. And I think that's uh, one of the things that makes it unique within the Anderson canon, is, 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 is it entirely kind of standalone uh, with this kind of, fusion of comedy and thrills and whoever you are watch out here i come i think the thing is on some films it's a massive group of people this was actually quite a small setup 
And so you did know all the members of the crew, whereas if you worked on other films, you'd never really get to first name terms with everybody. But I still remember a lot of the names there. And you mentioned the business about going to the pub and sometimes after work, there'd be a little foray into the bar after work as well. And I know all sorts of stuff went on there, but it was, it was fun because we all knew each other. We worked as a team. Everyone supported everybody else. Anything needed doing, you put down what you need and just went and helped. If they needed help on a sound studio, we'd go and do it. You know, that's the way it was. We just had a... When you're having a great time, things like the camaraderie come naturally. It's part of the, the, the fact that you're enjoying your work and you're enjoying the people you're working with. Uh, and I think the whole crew, is, in general, with the puppet side, as well as production, uh, there was a sense of family because we kind of owned the studio we were working in at the time, Bray Studios. It was a small studio and we were the biggest production in there. And although there was commercials coming in uh, occasionally and uh, rock bands would rehearse in the main stage, when they weren't there, it was our studio. And that kind of reinforced this sense of family, I think. Although there was kind of friendly rival between the puppets, puppet crew and the FREX crew, or, you know, the miniatures crew, uh, we all got on, had great friendships. It lasted well beyond the time when we were working on Terror Hawks. But also, the special effects boys and everything, we would watch what they were doing because we were matching what they were doing. So they would be doing a model shot of a spacecraft and we'd be shooting the interior of that spacecraft. So, you know, there was discussion between the two parties and sometimes we'd have the special event boys coming onto our set and, and oh my goodness, what's going to happen now? Because we'd be down the pit waiting for the explosions to happen above our heads. And, and Jerry was always one of those that would give people a chance. You never had to have a big CV and proof and this, that and other. I don't know whether he, he could see whether someone had a talent or, or whether he'd give them a go. But if you don't deliver, well, you had your go. Uh, there's a lot of people built the foundation of their careers working on Terrorhawks because it was uh, a film school. It was a wonderful time. We, we, we were young, we were enthusiastic. We, you know, we thought we could change the world in a way. Uh, we spent a lot of time in the bar chatting about what we were doing uh, with various senior members of the team. It was, uh, yeah, I think looking back, I wouldn't have done it any other way. I look, I look back very fondly on Terra Hawks. I, I, I think, with a couple of exceptions later on in my career, it's probably the most fun I've ever had. Um, I mean, you know, was, I couldn't believe I was actually getting paid to come in, paint backings, blow models up, and then uh, retire to the bar. You know, most of the evenings, which was uh, very nice. It was great fun. I'm very fond of it. Very fond of those times. Um, there's a lot, a lot of. Uh, negative vibe about the, the, the show but um, I'm very proud of it and I'm very glad to have been given the opportunity to work on it. <laughs>